I'm joined today by Dr. Lance Leota, who's professor and co-director of the Center for Applied Proteomics and Molecular Medicine and medical director for the certified CAP CLIA laboratory. We're going to talk about some of Dr. Leota's research into individualized cancer therapies, but we'll start a little bit with the context of cancer today. You know, Dr. Leota, I don't think I know many people who have not in some way been touched by cancer, either directly or by someone they know. And a common refrain is that cancer is more common than ever. Is that true in the sense that uh, we are seeing an increased rate of cancer or do we have to consider that longer life expectancy and having cures for other conditions that people used to die for are allowing people to live long enough to eventually get cancer? Very good question. Um, in, in, in 1971, when Richard Nixon declared the war on cancer, we thought curing cancer was straightforward, like going to the moon. But we didn't realize how tremendously difficult it is to cure cancer. And only now are we finally understanding how cancer works. So we were very hopeful about the future. But at the moment, there's an ever increasing burden of cancer on society. More people are dying of cancer every year. That's balanced off a little bit by the uh, enlarging population and the longer lifespan, but it's about one quarter of the population is will die of cancer. We are optimistic though, we have hope because uh, there is some evidence that we can extend life several years for many of the major types of cancer. It doesn't work as well if the cancer is advanced, but for the early stage cancer, we've been making advances on extending life. And overall, with the enormous progress in understanding how cancer works, we are very optimistic about the future. And I could tell you about some of the really exciting advances in cancer research that gives, give us very uh, great hope for the, for the future. Yeah, and I, I do want to get to that. But so is there is there a simple answer to cons adjusted for the fact that we have the largest population on this planet that we've ever had and the reality that people are living longer? What can we really say about the, the rate cancer and prevalence of is, cancer? is increasing uh, slightly, not dramatically, but it is increasing slightly. And in, for all the major cancers, some more than than others uh, and the trouble is that we can't be exactly sure about that answer because some of the statistics that we're looking at were collected many years ago. We don't have all the up-to-date statistics, but more or less cancer is increasing slightly in, in all the major kinds of uh, cancer. And that is somewhat balanced off by uh, those other factors that you mentioned, but doesn't, you know, uh, we, we're not looking to reduce the, cancer a little bit, we want to have a dramatic reduction in the incidence of cancer. And um, right now it's a terrible burden on society. So in fact, if you look at it that way, we are losing the war on cancer in terms of not making a major reduction in the number of cancer deaths. And what, or let me say it a different way, is there a consensus among the medical community as to why we are seeing this increase in the rate of cancer? Has it been pinpointed to something environmental or, or any sort of specific aggravating factor? Well, it's a combination of factors. We know certain carcinogens such as smoking cause cancer, but the effects of, the, of that smoking isn't realized till you know, 10, 20 years later and just emerging now. So the rate of lung cancer is continuing to increase and it's increasing at a faster rate in women um, and it may be related to smoking or to secondhand smoke, but there is an, an environmental cause. In other types of cancer, such as breast cancer, it might be a combination of hormonal therapy that was been used in uh, treating menopause, which that is uh, reduced now in terms of standard of care. So there might be a slight reduction in incidence of breast cancer due to that. Um, nevertheless, breast cancer continues to you know, um, be a severe 
problem. And for prostate cancer, it has a lot to do with early diagnosis. We're picking up more cancers at an earlier stage due to PSA with prostate cancer, but that has its own problems because some of those patients may not need treatment and we're over-treating them. So it's a mixture of different effects. At the same time, we're understanding more about the genetics and heritability of cancer and cancer-prone families, and we are studying that and we can uh, recognize certain genetic signatures of cancer risk. That's going to be very powerful in the future. But there are still major reasons why cancer is so hard to cure. Would you like me to tell you what those reasons are? Let's yes, but let me get one other question in first, and then we'll talk about why it's hard to cure. With and this may be sort of tie into my next question, which is talk about some of the ways in which today's predominant treatments are in many ways not ideal, which I'm sure includes in part lack of lack of being effective in some types of cancer but also with regard to often affecting the entire body when trying to treat a cancer that is actually quite localized. Yes, yes. So uh, the principle is that cancer is a disease of self. Your own cells have gone crazy and they're now invading their neighbors, spreading through the body and killing others in, in your cell population. So it's really hard to find a therapy that's specific for these cancer cells and doesn't hurt your normal cells because they're they're just uh, your normal cells essentially with a mental defect that causes them to behave in a terribly uh, malignant way. So that's why it's hard to have a specific therapy for cancer. It's not like a virus or a bacteria that's invading your body and that you could develop a therapy that's specific for those foreign cells, but these are your own cells that have gone crazy. That is the basic principle why it's so hard to find a therapy that kills the malignant cells but leaves the normal cells alone. Yes. Yeah. So so let's dig into that a little bit. Individualized cancer therapies. Talk a little bit about how that would work. Talk about what's on the horizon and what reasons we have to be optimistic. Yes, we have great reasons to be optimistic. So as I said, each patient's tumor is different at the molecular level. And some think that every single patient's tumor is different from every other's. It may look similar under the microscope, but they have a different constellation of genetic problems that are, or defects in the proteins or the metabolites, all different parts of the cell can contribute to the cancer malignant phenotype or malignant behavior. But now we recognize that we can map the circuitry of the cancer cell. It's like putting an ohm meter in and checking the circuit of an electronic transistor and resistor circuit, and we can see where all the protein signaling is flowing in that cancer cell. Once we get that circuit map of all the different proteins and how they're interacting to drive the cancer, make it grow, make it invade, we can then take that circuit map and individualize the therapy for that patient and say, you should get this therapy because we see that this part of your cancer circuitry is hyperactive, and if we shut that down, we can potentially block your cancer from having its ability to be malignant. We can also design therapies where we could have combinations that hit that uh, circuitry, that map of the cancer cell um, at different points so that the tumor cannot deviate or detour around the therapy that we give it, because too often, even if we know in that circuitry that there's a hyperactive point and we give a therapy for it, the tumor cell just detours around it and goes a different way, in the end still achieving its same goal of growing and invading and spreading. But if we look at that circuit map, and that's what we do in our lab, we measure the circuit map of, a, of cancer cells in patients, if we look at that circuit map, we might be able to have a combination therapy that rationally and wisely hits the circuit at different points so the tumor cell cannot detour around it. And so individualized combination therapy is the future. Dr. Leota, briefly in the limited time we have left, I would love to get your sense of a timeline for the drastic potential drastic reduction in cancer deaths. Some futurists like Ray Kurzweil, for example, believe that within 10 to 15 years, these individualized types of therapies 
will be so good that we will see drastic reductions in the number of people dying from some of the major forms of cancer. What sort of timeline do you see? It's very difficult to make predictions, and I and my predecessors and people over the past years have, have often predicted the next 10 years, next 15 years. But in this case, I can really say that we're optimistic that we can make dramatic uh, improvements in the next 10 to 15 years by the combination of all these approaches that I, that I stated. And the reason I'm hopeful is that we are making incremental but dramatic uh, effects on individual kinds of cancer, such as melanoma and then breast cancer and colon cancer prevention with polypectomies. And so we, if we take this into the future, we can see that we're just going to get better and better and it might be not all at once. There's not going to be one cancer cure that if, uh, we can use for all types of cancer. We're going to do it one cancer type at a time. We've been speaking with Dr. Lance Leota, professor and co-director of the Center for Applied Proteomics and Molecular Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us.